It's said that Azazel's beauty is second only to that of Slanesh. I'm going to be honest, if that's what counts as beautiful in the demon world, I'm, I'm sticking with ogres. Gorgeous. Prowling the mortal plane, Azazel's arrival is met with fanfare from the barbarians of the steppes, though his appearance is a portent most dire. The other three powers would be wise to take heed, for the day of the ecstatic legions is nigh. We're on turn one, how original, and already Azazel's got himself in a spot of bother. We're quite literally painted into a corner. Grand Café and its fancy fence to the south, Norska vying for a brawl to the west, pointy, impassable mountains to the east, and proof of flatter theory to the north. These obstacles and more will need to be swept aside if we mean to discover the location of Zambaijin, the lost city, and claim the altar of battle before our rival Chaos Champions. But to achieve such a feat, we'll first need to create a network of rifts to reveal the way. Sadly, the godbear Urson has been rescued by his fanatical followers, and so we'll need to open our rifts the old-fashioned way with copious amounts of suffering. A few tens of thousands of mortal souls should suffice nothing extravagant. These souls that we're to reap are harvested and sacrificed through battles, looting, sacking and raising settlements, events and two new mechanics introduced in the Champions of Chaos DLC, the Path to Glory and Gifts of Chaos. Purely demonic factions, like Zeech and friends, do not possess souls and are therefore wholly unworthy of our attention. For Azazel, this would make venturing further up the eastern steps a waste of precious time. And why bother, with Cafe so close, ripe for plundering and bloated with delicious souls to corrupt and devour. Come on, Eglixius. Let's go punch some mortals in the face. Or do whatever this is. This shouldn't take any fancy tactics, but Azazel's got both speed and aerial superiority, two assets that we'll use to divide and conquer. We scatter the Norskan cavalry and quickly overwhelm their infantry, securing a swift end to the battle. Well done, us. Our devotees are bloodlusting following their victory, so we've decided to keep the party going. Using the warband recruitment mechanic, we'll instantly add a unit of marauders and a unit of Chaos Warhounds to our rave wagon and roll it on over to the Red Fortress. We'll entice the defending marauder hunters with our impressive spread of hors d'oeuvres before committing unspeakable horrors in the name of Slanesh. The enemy's entrenched, but we've got numbers on our side, so we break our forces into groups and assault the settlement on four fronts, spreading the defenders to their limits. and warhounds are pinned by a unit of spearmen, but our numbers are prevailing. One final push should break the Norskan spirits. Battle's all but over, so Azazel's going to have just a, 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 a tiny little sit down whilst his cultists mop up the blood. Red Fortress flies a purple flag, but our victory nets us more than choice real estate. The Norskans are an impressionable lot, and we've only gone and occupied the Kuj Norskan homeland, vassalizing them in doing so. We'll put our unpaid employees to work in due course, but the Red Fortress holds another secret to first explore. This UI element signifies a dark fortress, which are a semi-rare type of settlement dotted around the world map. 
as our task is to spread misery and reap souls taking us far and wide, we'll have little need for a sprawling empire. Sporadic bases from which to launch our insidious incursions will be more than sufficient. Dark fortresses, which are typically faction capitals, offer unique building chains and are amongst the most defensible of all settlements. Now we have a place to hang our demonic hat and a few souls in the bank, we can evoke the gifts of chaos. This dark compass offers seven runous slots in which boons can be activated in exchange for a sacrifice of souls. Additional slots are unlocked in the technology tree, whilst more gifts are earned after a specific number of souls have been sacrificed. These boons have the potential to grant game-changing benefits, so we'll be liberal with our spending. To solidify our influence in the Red Waste, we'll turn our gaze to Dragon's Crossroad. And by gaze, I of course mean the aforementioned Raid Wagon. They will see beauty. Cafe's defenders are trampled against our ecstatic legions and the Red Waste are ours. We gift Dragon's Crossroad to our Norsecan friends and set the Exploit Vassals commandment, because we're really good friends. Speaking of good friends, Azazel's been impressed with some of our marauders and envisions a bright future for them as disgusting fleshy monsters. Using the Warband Upgrades mechanic will give this unit a makeover and bestow upon these cheeky lads the Nesh's highest honour, some whips. We've established a foothold in the Red Wastes, employed the locals and are ready to expand our sphere of influence into Grand Café. They may not want what we're selling, but the promise of all those souls is too tempting a proposition to ignore so we gather our depraved disciples and heed the call of wholesome adventure. Turtle Gate's walls are well defended, so we split our offensive into three fronts. Two groups for the walls, and one to charge through the city, capturing points. So many creatures, so our frontal assault takes casualties, but we're soon behind the walls. It doesn't take long for victory to follow. Alright folks, we're in. We've got a second army brewing in the Red Fortress and a grand new world to destroy. Smells like we're ripe for a montage, if you ask me. Once my sword is drawn, it must taste blood! Mors told me to listen, so talk! Oh, I do enjoy a good montage. We've reaped a decent amount of souls, but we're still a way off from our goal. Miao Ying and her northern provinces are next on our to terrorize list, but before we ride off into the sunset, there's some merits to dish out. Eglixius has performed excellently in our violent conquest so far. He's displaying a keen willingness to learn, a strong aptitude for mortal murdering, and is an all-round team player. For that, he's earned himself a mark of chaos. Once Eglixius has dedicated himself to Slanesh, he sheds off his meaty mortal shell and transcends into something better. He also loses half his rank and his skills are reset because with great power comes great reinvention and I don't want to clip his wings. Fight. The Dissenter Lords of Jinshin are next to face our indiscriminate harvesting. Sucks to be them. Time to spread those attackers. The more inroads into the settlement, the better chance we have at capturing points. And I love capturing points. The bulk of our attacks taking on the west of the city, whilst our cavalry will charge up the middle. The east is left to a smaller, but no less capable force. Enemy reinforcements could be a problem, but we press the assault all the same. In for a penny and all that.
Oh, those poor people. Our cavalry and chariots tear into the middle of the city, spreading mayhem in their wake, and the Dissenter Lords are in disarray. Yay. With 10,000 souls harvested and many of them sacrificed in the name of Stanesh, we begin to see the fruits of our labor manifest. The first rifts have opened, giving us further tactical advantage over our enemies and offering a shortcut to distant lands. But we'll need more souls to open additional rifts. Thankfully, there are plenty more mortals to be harvested among Xiao Ming's followers, and beyond the smoldering ruins of Grand Cathay, await the gluttonous souls of the Ogre Kingdoms. Aziza. No rest for the depraved, though for Azazel, spreading Slanesh's influence is the height of delight. He would rather savour the sweet screams of his victims, but alas, time is of the essence. And only one champion of chaos can win the race to Zanbaijin.